Well, let's, let's open in a word of prayer then. Lord God, thank you once again for bringing these ladies here tonight to study your word and fellowship together. Um, goodness, we, you, you know all of the hurdles that went into getting people to, to be able to show up for this study over the last six weeks, for getting this study written and taught. And um, we just praise you for making a way for, for this um, lesson and all of the things that you have taught us through the women that you, you um, created and purposefully worked through uh, throughout history. Pray that tonight you would just let our hearts be attentive to exactly what you would have us um, each individually come away from this lesson with, and that uh, just overall we would take what we are learning and use it to glorify you and serve others. Amen. Amen. So welcome back last week of our summer study. Hi, Kimber where we have been looking at some of the women in Scripture that God used to accomplish His will in the world. Tonight, we're going to wrap up our study by looking at a passage that highlights the results of living as a wise, God-fearing woman. So you're probably... Are all of you familiar with Proverbs 31? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, sadly, I think most of us might be familiar with this because we've all heard teaching on it that might have built up this woman as a superhuman ideal that all godly women must reach for and strive to be. (laughs) But tonight, I hope that we can change some of those impressions because that, you know, it would always intimidate me when I would hear this preach and I would think, well, it's impossible. I can't do all of that. I will never be that. That isn't even stuff I like to do. So how can I be a godly woman? But tonight we're going to try to change those impressions. And we see, as we look at how just lovely a picture this passage paints of a woman who fears the Lord. And we all should strive to fear the Lord. This passage was not written or meant to intimidate or shame or condemn women. It should not make you feel bad because its purpose and intent was to build up and encourage. Um, I was reading that in the in Jewish homes on the Sabbath, this is read by the male, the head of the household, to praise the, wim- the women of the household. So it is definitely supposed to encourage and be heroic, this heroic, you know, praise of women. So before we take a closer look, we need to understand how the Proverbs should be read. Because I know early in my Christian life, I often read the Proverbs as promises or prescriptive commands. So that made coming to verses like train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart far from it seem really wrong, because I knew plenty of godly parents who devoted their whole lives to training their children in the fear of the Lord, and when their children were adults, some of them strayed. So what happened? Well, think about non-biblical proverbs. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. (laughs) We don't understand that to mean that if you eat an apple every day, you will never get sick, right? So that way of looking at the proverbs is also Wrong. The book of Proverbs is classified as wisdom wisdom literature, and wisdom literature, especially in the ancient Near East, was compilations of observations about life. So in the book of God's people, in Scripture, Proverbs are observations about how to live well in God's good world. Proverbs 1 lays this out in uh, the first few verses that this this compilation of wisdom sayings is meant to be advice in order to guide and give examples to us of how to live a life that pleases God. It shows us that God's wisdom applied to life is, is what is desired, right? Also, if you read Proverbs, you can see the contrast of what living contrary to God's ways looks like. And that's also spelled out pretty vividly. (laughs) 
The Proverbs are um, far more about who you are and about being than about what you do or doing. So in other words, Proverbs should not be read as this um, formula or checklists that you do in order to achieve a positive end result. The overarching theme of the book is fearing the Lord. So this collection of wisdom sayings describes so many outcomes of fearing the Lord. People who fear the Lord will look like this all throughout the book. So if the book of Proverbs gives all kinds of lessons of wisdom, and if its theme is the result of fearing the Lord, the very last chapter of the book, Proverbs 31, wraps it all up very neatly by making all the lessons of wisdom that have been shared in chapters 1 through 30 concrete and practical. Proverbs 31 gives us a tangible example of what living in wisdom and in the fear of the Lord could look like. So remember, not if you do all these things that the Proverbs 31 woman does, you will achieve wisdom and fear of the Lord. No, it should be, here's one example of what a wise woman who fears the Lord might look like. Does that make sense? Okay. Because certainly over the last five weeks, we've seen portraits of God-fearing women, right? All of them displayed wisdom and fear of the Lord a little differently. We learned a little something different from each of them. So we should view this poem in Proverbs the same way. And I mentioned poem because this is a poem in Hebrew. It's an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet that's cleverly put together, together in like a poetic way in the original language that doesn't quite come across the same way in English. So keep all of that in mind as we come at this tonight. And because we don't have time, we are not going to read the whole passage. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it. We'll kind of drop in and out of certain parts of it. But I think at the end of the night with this um, wider, like a, a, a wide overview of the intentions of the chapter, you will be able to go home and study it in depth on your own this week to pull out particular wisdom that God might be highlighting for you individually at this time in your life. So let's look at the first question in our workbooks. It's what is Proverbs 31 not? Well, these verses are certainly not a job description. So instead, like I said before, this is an affirmation of what those who fear the Lord can look like. This is an example of how fearing the Lord can be embodied, but it's not the only example of how fearing the Lord can be embodied. This description is not there in the Bible to imply that everyone must directly and exactly imitate her if they fear the Lord and obey him. It's written in order to inspire people to live their lives in the many ways that can express God's wisdom and justice and love. So let's read verses 10 through 11 to get us started. It says, A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Is this passage talking about just wives in particular? Yes and no. The word in Hebrew is actually not wife, but woman. So a woman of noble character who can find. While it does describe a woman who's married, and it is advice that King Lemuel got regarding the kind of wise, God-fearing woman he should marry, this poem is not only describing a married woman. If King Lemuel's mother was telling him about the kind of woman he should marry, these qualities in this woman can be found in a non-married woman, right? There's so much in this piece of scripture for married, non-married alike, men and women honestly, because it's a poem about someone who is wise and fears the Lord. Wise and godly women will have many and varied callings. Not every wise and godly woman will have the detailed kind of life like the Proverbs 31 woman has, and she's not expected to. So if we know that these verses are just one example of what God, a God-fearing woman looks like, we need to consider what wisdom and what fear is according to to God. So have you ever heard of Lady Wisdom? If you've read through the Proverbs, you've probably encountered her. Who is Lady Wisdom? In Proverbs 8, we get the first of several passages in Proverbs in which wisdom is personified as a woman. Now, Israelite men saw women as the sources of wisdom. So this 
makes perfect sense. Rejecting Lady Wisdom's advice was equivalent to hating knowledge and outright rejecting the fear of the Lord. So Proverbs 8, if you go read it, describes this personified Lady Wisdom as aggressively seeking to be found. And when she is, her rewards are amazing. She grants life and truth. But how does that happen? Well, the book of Proverbs shows us that wisdom is derived from God and reflects his character. So then it isn't surprising that we see a correlation all over scripture between following the wise path and following the righteous, obedient path. All of the passages that describe Lady Wisdom throughout Proverbs in the Bible highlight wisdom leading to walking in obedience. In fact, Proverbs 8.20 says, Wisdom walks in righteousness and justice. So fearing the Lord and seeking wisdom lead to a desire to obey. Psalm 112.1 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. So again, hand in hand, fearing the Lord and doing what is right. Living according to God's holy ways or living righteously is wise. So Lady Wisdom tells us to seek wisdom by beginning with the fear of the Lord and then expect to be led to the humble desire to obey and be guided on the righteous path. Wisdom described in the Proverbs is rooted always in a relationship with the Most High God and in the personal knowledge of His ways. So it's a relational knowledge that directly impacts our relationship with others. We have a relationship with God. We love Him. We fear Him. We want to do what is right. And that manifests in our lives in the way that we act with others. Proverbs doesn't describe wisdom as like how smart you are or how much knowledge you have. The smartest people in the world could collect and understand all kinds of knowledge and might even know all kinds of things about God. But those same people might not have ever truly experienced anything with God personally, right? They're not wise. As we continue to look at the Proverbs 31 woman, remember wisdom according to the Proverbs has to do with one's character and being, living righteously, doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with God, like Micah 6, 8 says. It's not just knowledge or a checklist of what to do and what not to do. So this woman in Proverbs 31 exemplifies this way of being through her actions. Okay, now, what does the word um, noble or valor, is another way to translate it, convey? So it's, um, <coughs> describing, it's describing her character, right? Noble character, as the NIV says. Other translations might say a woman of virtue or a woman of valor. Um, valor, I like that one the best because the word in Hebrew has to do with power and strength of character. It's the same word that describes brave men going into battle. So it gives us this picture of a steadfast, strong, and devoted woman. The end of verse 11 says that her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. So what kind of value is being spoken of here? She is trustworthy. She has displayed the kind of character through her interactions with others and with her relationship with her husband to be someone who has been proven to be honorable and able to be easily trusted. Her contribution to those she relates to brings valuable blessing. It's as if those who know her are recipients of this great treasure. And again, this relates back to that um, descriptor in verse 10, that she's a worthy woman. What qualities make her worthy? Well, as you read the rest of the passage, you can see that in verses 13 through 19, her worth to her household is described. And then in verses 20 through 27, her worth to her community is described. She's noble primarily because of all of the ways she serves others. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That is what she does. Fearing the Lord and walking in wisdom will result in utilizing the gifts God has given you for the benefit of others. If we look at her actions, this woman, we see how this all plays out. She's a prudent steward of her resources. 
She manages all the affairs of her household intelligently and provides for her servants. She's not afraid of hard work. And in fact, she prepares herself for the expectation that the work will be hard and she will need to be strong and endure. Now, who are these works benefiting? They're always benefiting others. The results of her character are seen in how she serves others. She's a servant leader and looks for ways to help those who are needy. She's respected in the community, but also known for being charitable. So all in all, she's strong, hardworking, others-focused, and honorable woman. The point about all of these actions is that she makes good, productive use of the talents God gifted her with in order to bless and serve others. Now in Proverbs uh, 31.25, what do you think it means that she laughs at the future? This is a phrase that's actually used in other places in Scripture. Um, I think even it says, you know, at one point, God laughs kind of at the future, talking about his enemies who might be winning right now, but then later, you know, they're obviously not going to win, and so God can laugh about it. <laughs> this, um, this phrase indicates confidence. So she looks at the future without worry or anxiety. She's confident God is in control, and she can trust that he will provide. It reminds me of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6. So in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, in verse 25 of, of Matthew 6, it says, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about what you will wear. And then verse 27 says, Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Verse 32 says, Your heavenly Father knows what you need. So don't run after those things like the pagans do. Then he wraps up this whole teaching about not being anxious about the future by saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness goes hand in hand with wisdom and fear of the Lord, just like we talked about earlier. If you look at the end of Proverbs 31, verse 26, she says, it says, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. And that phrase, faithful instruction, um, is also translated kindness. So this verse is stating the importance of speaking wisdom and truth based on God's word, but doing so gently and with love. In verses 30 and 31, we learn what her most important and praiseworthy attribute is. The theme of Proverbs, this woman fears the Lord. Now, why would fear of the Lord be connected with her works? We've kind of already hinted at it, but this is probably the most important thing we can take away from this whole lesson, okay? The exact way she works out her fear of the Lord through her industriousness is one example of how it can be done. But ultimately, fearing the Lord is the most important thing anyone, man or woman, can do. So how do we fear the Lord? Well, I spoke a little bit earlier about how fear of the Lord and walking in obedience are correlated, but if we had to just boil it down exactly what fear, fear of the Lord, fearing the Lord, we see it all over scripture, what that was in the simplest of terms. If you look throughout the Bible, you find that it describes that to fear the Lord is to yield to the fact that he's the ruler and the reigning king of the universe, that he is the ruler and reigning king of the universe which makes you wonder, do you, do I, yield our whole life to his rulership or just parts of it? In ancient times, this type of fear was understood more like how we might think of allegiance or loyalty. So it was not just belief in, like, I believe in the Most High God, yeah, he exists, or like reverence or being scared. It encompassed like who you served, who you obeyed, where your loyalty lay. So in the Old Testament, the followers of the Most High God recognized and lived out the reality that God was truly supreme. He was the best and only thing that should inform how they would live and work and interact with other people. And then you jump ahead into the New Testament. When you look at the early church in Acts, Fearing God and putting your faith in Jesus was recognizing and living out the reality that Jesus was truly Lord, supreme ruler, and living out the reality that the risen king was the best thing in life and the only thing in life that could inform 
you how to live, work, and interact or love others. So God, both in ancient days and today, has offered himself to us in order that we might rely upon his attributes, his strength and wisdom, in order that we might live in a way that glorifies him. So when you and I truly fear the Lord, it shows because we will begin to live in utter dependence and allegiance to Christ. And that fruit will show, right? The fruit of the Spirit. So what is the most praiseworthy attribute of this woman according to Proverbs 31.30? It is her fear of the Lord. This emphasis at the end of the poem is on the woman's fear of the Lord. And rightly so, because fearing the Lord led her Um, led to her desiring to live out her everyday circumstances by making choices that would best result in demonstrating mercy, love, and justice to everyone in her life, everyone in her community. This wise woman of valor should not intimidate us, but rather should encourage us to pursue the fear of the Lord. So how that is tangibly lived out will look different for each of us, right, in all of the details. And she's just a metaphor. She's not even a real woman. But we do have a living flesh and blood embodiment of the wisdom of God in Christ. You can find um, 1 Corinthians 1.24, Colossians 2, 2 and 3, they call Jesus the wisdom of God. If you want to model the perfect embodiment of the wisdom and fear of God, study the Gospels and the way Jesus lived and taught others to live, the faultless example he gave of what walking in the fear of the Lord for the benefit of others looks like. So we come to this end of this study of all the women that we have looked at, and there's so many more, which would be so fun to, keep, to dive in deep on some of these other ladies in the Old and New Testament. But we end with this Proverbs 31 woman, who I think we see a little bit of in every woman that we studied over the last five weeks. So I think we should ask God this week to help us recognize our giftings, just like all the women that we've looked at this week, and help us to seek to use them as servant leaders to those in our lives, just like this woman and just like all the women that we've studied in the past.